Hi, welcome to Chapter Book Storytime. I'm Ellen from EDPL Oakland, and on this week's edition of the Variety Pack, I have the start of a science fiction series by a well-known author. The book is called I Am the Walrus, and the authors are Neil Schusterman and Eric Elfman. Neil Schusterman is an award-winning author, and anytime I've read anything by Schusterman, I've I've been haunted afterwards. He always gives us a lot to think about. So when I saw he was writing a book for middle grade readers, I thought, I have to try this, and I wasn't disappointed. This is a story of Noah Prime, and a lot of strange things have been happening to Noah lately. I'm going to read the inside of the book jacket. Uh, it gives a really good introduction into the book. When 14-year-old Noah falls from the trees onto his classmate Sahara, he doesn't understand how or why he would have been up there. It's just one more in a strange of strange things happening to Noah lately. Like when he keels over and every muscle in his body freezes when confronted by bullies. And when he vanishes into the background of, at a moment when he doesn't want to be noticed by his teacher. What does it all mean? Well, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to chapter six to show you one of the incidents that happens to Noah. It's just bizarre and kind of hilarious. Chapter six, like the plague. Noah's friend Ogden convinces him that they should go to the dance together. As Ogden says, I'm sick of standing in a corner alone. This way we can stand in a corner alone together, which was another oxymoron. Ogden claimed he was building up momentum until he reached the glorious moment when he would actually act, ask a girl to dance. There was no telling how close that moment was, but Ogden was determined to get there. As there were seven dances scheduled for the school year, someone had the bright idea to have each one celebrate a different continent. The theme of this particular continental cotillion was Antarctic adventure. The decorations featured hundreds of sparkling white snowflakes, and as the gym was perpetually cold, it just added to the illusion, as did all the blue lips, since too much food coloring had been added to their glacier punch. Noah and Ogden weren't exactly in the corner, but they were on the sidelines with a gaggle of other kids. The dance floor was filled with what Ogden called the early adapters. In other words, kids who quickly warmed to awkward and unnatural social situations. They either danced with partners or gyrated alone as detached ions in the test tube of human experience. Noah's not, Noah was not one to dance alone, and although he didn't really have a problem asking girls to dance, he didn't want to abandon Ogden on the sidelines. I may achieve critical mass tonight, Ogden informed Noah. This was Ogden speak for, I might ask a girl to dance. Turns out he didn't have to, because a girl whose intensely blue lips telegraphed an overdose of sugar approached the line of wistful wallflowers like an Antarctic blizzard, and she grabbed the first available hand. Dance, she said. The hand was Ogden's, and he was helpli helplessly swept out onto the dance floor, plunging into the tumultuous sea like a calving glacier. Noah would have been content to watch the spectacle of Ogden attempting to dance, but then he spotted Sahara across the gym. This is the girl he fell onto out of the trees. Her dress was green, which clashed with the theme of the dance. And now that he had seen her, he could not unsee her. No matter where he looked, her green figure punctuated his periphery. She was perhaps the only girl there who, felt he, who he felt nervous asking to dance. That annoyed him, so he decided he wouldn't be like Ogden, waiting until he mined enough nerve from the depths of his soul. He would cross the gym and ask her now. When she invariably said no, he would at least know that he had tried. She eyed him warily as he approached. Hey, he said. What? I can't hear you. Hey, he shouted. Oh, it's you. Noah couldn't help but notice that she looked at his arms as if checking for hairiness that was not there. That was another episode that was very embarrassing that she had witnessed. Nice dress, he said. What? Your dress, definitely not Antarctic. You're making a statement. FYI, it's not on purpose. It's the only dress I have, and I have that doesn't make me look horrible. I don't think anything could make you look horrible. What? I said, never mind, she screamed. Listen, if you're going to ask me to dance, just get it over with before we both lose our voices. 
So, do you want to dance? No. No? Then why did you make me ask? So you could get it out of your system. Which, as Noah had already noted to himself, was exactly the reason why he had come over here. That meant that Sahara really understood him, and it made him want to dance with her all the more. Sahara apparently got that too because she said, you asked the wrong question. Do I want to dance? No, there's way too much perfume and bad cologne on the dance floor, but will I dance? Yes. And she stepped out onto the dance floor with Noah. The DJ was in the middle of a set of 80 songs. He was attempting a mashup of Freeze Frame and Cold as Ice. They were two songs that didn't mash up so much as they beat one another with chairs like professional wrestlers. Noah gamely started to dance, but due to the mix-up mashup, he couldn't find the beat and ended up ineffectually shuffling back and forth, which is what most of the other guys were doing, but he usually had better rhythm. The mashup came to a merciful end, but it segued into a slow song, and Noah knew he had to make the decision, back self-consciously off the dance floor or sweep Sahara into his arms. So, said Sahara. So, said Noah. He was never one to back away from a challenge, so he put his arms around her waist. She draped hers over his shoulders, and they joined the few, the nervous, the slow dancers. You're not terrible at this, Sahara told him. Thanks. But as not terrible as he was, there were some moments that could not be avoided. About two minutes into the dance, he achieved the most feared literal misstep of a school dance. His left foot came down on Sahara's toes. Ouch! Oops, sorry. He could feel his ears and cheeks going red from embarrassment. But the feeling didn't stop there. And no one knew that something odd was about to happen, that he had no power to stop. Like the moment you know without question that you're going to hurl. Noah let Sahara go and he backed up. Then he ducked his chin down so hard the back of his neck hurt. What are you doing? She asked. I don't know. Then he lifted his chin so high that his Adam's apple hurt, and he began slapping his hands to his sides over and over. Are you choking? No, no. Is this a new dance I should know? Uh, I don't think so. Then suddenly his words left him, and out of his mouth came a bizarre, rhythmic shrieking that made everyone else on the dance floor turn in their direction. Now he found himself swinging his head from side to side, and then dipping it and raising it and letting loose with, some, with that sh same shriek again. The moment was beyond horrific. It was worse than any anxiety dream he had ever experienced. Yet, as strange as all this was, there was a wordless part of him that was telling him that this was perfectly natural, a normal thing to do under the circumstances. It was a part of him that refused to pay any attention to the rest of his brain or to the strange looks he was getting from Sahara and everyone else around him. Dude, what's your deal? Someone asked. His answer was another shrill squawk. Noah, said Sahara, stop it. You're really freaking me out. As he looked at her, he had an overwhelming urge to jam his nose into the soft white feathers on her neck, which was strange because Sahara had no such feathers. And so rather than give in to that urge, Noah decided it was time to call it a night. Gotta go, he squeaked, and then raced out a side door and didn't stop running until he got home. <laughs> Chapter 7 Market research. You're home from the dance early, Noah's mother said as he walked in. Oh, uh, that dance was for the birds, he replied, heading toward his room quickly so he wouldn't have to face any more questions. Clearly, something was terribly wrong with him, and he knew he'd have to tell his parents about the various weird um, behaviors that had come over him lately, but he didn't want to freak them out as much as he was freaked out. He wanted to get more information first. He shut the door to his room, opened his laptop, and found a health website. Then he typed his latest weird behavior. Involuntary screeching, uncontrollable arm and head movements. The website returned an alert reading, brain tumor suspected, get help immediately. Or stroke suspected, get help immediately. Soon there's a knock on the door. It's Ogden, and the first thing he says is, I figured it out. Noah was not surprised. Ogden figured out things on a regular basis. He figured out that gravity was an illusion and it works only because everyone believes in it. He figured out that a majority of rock stars are holograms and don't actually exist. He figured out that evolved dinosaurs were planting random fossils in places like their town just to mess with us. 
With all that in mind, Noah was doubtful, but it was always worth to hear Ogden out because his theories were so detailed, you could almost believe them. I'm all ears, Noah said. Actually, you might be, Ogden responded, in the right situation. Then with profound seriousness, he went with Noah into his room and closed the door to make sure no one else could hear what he had to say. Okay, Noah said, spill it. What you did at the dance was classic behavior, Ogden told him. Noah shook his head. Only if by that you mean classically humiliating. You didn't let me finish, Ogden said. What you did at the dance was classic behavior for an emperor penguin seeking a mate. Excuse me? Observe. Then Ogden turned to Noah's computer and pulled up a video. In, on the screen, a pair of penguins faced each other on a field of ice. One penguin, presumably the male, lowered his head to his chest, then raised his face to the sky as he began slapping his flippers against his side. When the penguin began emitting a piercing mating call, Noah hit pause on the video. He had seen enough. There was no question that the male penguin was doing exactly what he had done at the dance. And Although Noah knew he shouldn't let it bother him, he did notice that the female penguin seemed much more receptive to the male's attention than Sahara had been. Ogden leaned away from the computer screen, a triumphant look on his face and said, when under emotional or physical stress, you take on the traits of different animals, defense mechanisms, instinctual responses. And then he raised his eyebrows. Mating rituals. That's ridiculous. Many ridiculous things are true, Ogden pointed out. Humans share 50% of their genes with bananas. It rains diamonds on Saturn. Fruit Loops are all the same flavor. Are not, are too, look it up. There was no arguing with Ogden sometimes, but this theory, it was, it was, actually, it would explain a lot, wouldn't it? When you froze on the stairway, you were being pushed around by three other kids, right? You reacted by playing dead. You weren't just playing possum, you were being one. Noah started running some of the other events through this new lens. And what happened to me on the gymnastic rings? How I was suddenly so good at it and how my arms got hairy. Like an ape or a monkey. You mean I'm turning into different animals? No, Ogden said, not turning into them, but you are taking on some of their most important traits. Noah shook his head. No. As usual, you're adding two plus two and coming up with 22. Well, then I'll prove it, Nogden said, but we have to put you in a stressful situation first. Am I not already in a stressful situation? Apparently not stressful enough. Ogden smiled and then hauled back his hand and slapped Noah across the face, full force. Hey, Noah said, that hurt. Not enough said Ogden, we'll have to find a way to release the animal. And he looked around the room, grabbed a baseball bat and held it over across his shoulder. Ogden, hold up, Noah said, taking a step back. Right, Ogden said, putting down the bat. That might have other and unintended results. He took a moment to consider and then said, I have a better idea. There's something we need at the supermarket. What? You'll see. The supermarket closes at 10 and it's already 9.30. Perfect, said Ogden. It's mostly downhill. You can ride on my handlebars. It was nearly 10 when Noah and Ogden entered the market. We're closing in five minutes, said the lone checker, without even looking up from her phone to see them. She was clearly annoyed that she'd have to remain for the duration. Make it quick. We intend to, said Ogden, and then he led Noah back to the meat department. Just beside the meat case was a door that led to the mysterious back of the store where only employees were allowed. It featured a large sign reading, Unauthorized Access Prohibited. Noah hesitated. So Ogden got behind him and gently pushed, but that made Noah all the more resistant. Come on, what are you waiting for? You still haven't told me why we're here. It's a show, don't tell kind of thing, Ogden said which served to make Noah curious enough to cross into the dreaded back room. Still, he couldn't help but hold his breath as he stepped through the door, even though his first glimpse of the secret chamber was utterly disappointing. Stacks of cardboard boxes, fruit, an assortment of brooms and a few hand carts. But then he saw where Ogden was heading, the freezer. Ogden pulled the silver handle of the walk-in freezer and swung open the door. 
Frost poured out like a Halloween fog machine, revealing entire sides of beef hanging on hooks that looked as if they were ripped right out of Noah's worst nightmare. Ogden, there's a reason why this place is prohibited and unauthorized. I mean, what if the night butcher catches us or something? Work with me, Noah, Ogden said, and there's no such thing as the night butcher, he added. At least I don't think there is. Come on, help me. Ogden moved through the icy fog and into the freezer, but Noah stayed at the threshold, feeling goose flesh already rising from the cold, in spite of his hoodie. I'm not going in there until I know what you... And then came a thud. Actually, it was more like a whomp. And the sides of beef began swinging and bumping into one another as if they had come to life. Help! He heard Ogden call. One of them fell on me! Noah, help! Noah sighed, and it came out as a blast of steam in the cold air. If someone had told Noah that he'd be rescuing Ogden from a frozen meat attack, he would not have... No, actually, when it came to Ogden, he would have believed it. This was exactly the kind of thing Ogden was famous for. The side of beef was so huge, Ogden was completely hidden beneath it. Only you, Ogden, could be decked by half a dead cow. It was even heavier than it looked. Noah had to use all his strength to get enough leverage to flip it. And once he did, Ogden wasn't there. And then behind him, he heard a voice. What are you doing here? But it wasn't the voice of the night butcher. Noah turned to see the last person he expected to run into that night. It was none other than Sahara. Of all the industrial freezers in the world, why did she have to walk into his... She had seen them on their way to the, to the grocery store, so she decided to follow them. What are you doing here? She demanded when she cornered Noah in the freezer, wrestling a side of beef, which took the concept of playing with your food to a whole new level. What am I doing here? What are you doing here? Noah put back on her. She could do the whole I asked you first thing, but that would just be childish. I came here to tell you that I have absolutely nothing to say to you, she told him. Well, you're saying something now, he reminded her. That's beside the point. After the weird way you behaved at the dance tonight, I want to make it crystal clear that I want absolutely nothing to do with you from now until the end of time. Okay, he said. Then why are you still just standing there? I'm not, she yelled. I'm storming away. Uh... No, actually, you're not. And then another sound filled the freezer. It was neither a thud nor a whomp. It was more like a ka -chung. a very heavy and unpleasant ka -chung. It was a kind of sound beyond which no others mattered. Ogden, said Noah, Ogden. But Ogden was not in the freezer. He was on the other side of the massive stainless steel door, the one he had just closed on Noah. And Sahara, and Sahara. Ogden had only intended to leave them in there for about 30 minutes, but the manager came by and shooed Ogden out of the store. So Noah and Sahara are left in the freezer and no one can get to them. Chapter eight, stop your blubbering. Inside the freezer, the pounding and the cursing and the unrepeatable threats against Ogden did nothing to get that door open. Phones, said Sahara. They both pulled out their phones, but the freezer walls were too thick to get even a single bar. That's when they realized how cold it was. They already knew it was cold, it being a freezer, but it wasn't until they stopped moving that they began to feel the true bone chill of the place. Okay, said Noah. Well, the good news is that there's no wind chill factor. Sahara stared at him, shaking her head in amazement. Seriously? Lemonade, Sahara, he said. I'm just trying to make lemonade, okay? Yeah, well, it's already turning into a slushy. Noah had a meager hoodie. Sarah had a light windbreaker. Neither item did a thing to keep out the cold. Noah, this is serious, said Sahara. You see this kind of thing in the news every day. Clickbait, Noah told her. The headlines are misleading. People don't usually die in freezers. People usually don't have a friend who locks them in for fun. It wasn't for fun, and but I see your point. Noah was sure that Ogden would let them out, but after 15 minutes, it became clear that neither he nor anyone else was coming to their rescue. 
Sarah huddled in a corner, and Noah went over to her. Stay away from the steel wall, he said. It will drain your heat faster. Don't you think I know that? He stayed beside her, and it occurred to him what they needed to do. I know this sounds like a line, but we should huddle to conserve body heat. In truth, Sahara was thinking the same thing, but she didn't want to be the one to suggest it. How sad if they froze to death because neither of them was willing to make the first move. Fine, she said, but this doesn't mean anything. Noah didn't respond, but he wrapped his arms around her and pulled her close as, he, as close as he could. It wasn't the worst thing in the world, but what was she thinking? Everything about this was terrible. She reassessed the room. In addition to the hanging meat, there were cardboard boxes of prepackaged stuff. We could put the cardboard beneath our clothes for insulation, she suggested. Good idea, Noah said, but he made no move to get up. And although she wanted to spring into action, the sheared body warmth thing was hard to give up. She had been on the verge of major shivering before, but at least for the moment, she was okay. She knew, however, that it wouldn't last for either of them. Noah knew it too. He could feel his nose and ears becoming increasingly numb, but inside, there was a tingling from his core. At first, he thought it was just because he had his arms around Sahara. But to be honest, in, the, in that moment, that felt more awkward than anything else. And that tingling, he had felt it before. When he was up on the rings and he thought he was going to make an absolute fool of himself. When he was on the dance floor and did make an absolute fool of himself, the tingling resolved into an odd warmth and his clothes began to feel very uncomfortable. Sahara looked at him strangely. Are you okay? Which was a stupid question because the two of them were most definitely not okay. You look funny. Not surprising because he felt funny. He looked at his hands. His fingers looked thicker, his skin looked stretched, and his clothes, they didn't just feel uncomfortable. They felt painful. They were cutting into his skin. Sahara didn't notice that because she was so fixated on his face. He didn't, seem to, he didn't seem like the same boy he was a moment ago. The shape of his face actually changed. She had seen this before. She knew exactly what was happening. You're having an allergic reaction, she told him. What are you allergic to? Do you have an EpiPen? Um, I, I don't think that's it, Noah said Noah. And then the seams on his hoodie burst. Noah knew this was going to get worse before it got better. His t-shirt held, but now as he swelled, he knew the shirt wouldn't hold much longer and the fabric was hurting so much he didn't want it to. There was a tiny hole in the shirt just to the right of his navel. He dug a finger into the hole and tugged at it. That's all it took to make the t-shirt shred and out from it burst a gelatinous wave of fat. Sahara pulled away from him, staring in disbelief. Noah, my gosh, what's wrong? What's happening to you? And he knew. He knew because Ogden's crazy theory wasn't so crazy after all. Don't be scared, he said in a voice that sounded like him, but played at a much slower speed. But I think I have a blubber problem. Sahara did not know what to say to that. This was not a phrase commonly spoken in any language under any circumstances. Yet as she watched Noah's expanding gut spill out over the taut elastic of his sweatpants, she realized that there was no other way to describe it. Does it hurt, she asked, and she immediately felt stupid for asking. No, he said, it just feels odd. Sahara knew there had to be an explanation for this. There were explanations for everything, and once you knew it, whatever was so strange or so disturbing didn't seem that way anymore. Perhaps this was a hallucination brought on by hypothermia, or perhaps he was turning into a walrus, said Noah in a strange rubbery voice. I feel very walrusy. It turns out that one of Ogden's crazy theories is true. Whenever Noah is placed in a stressful situation, he takes on the characteristics of an animal that will help him survive it. I have so many questions. Is this a government experiment gone wrong? Does Noah have a genetic mutation that he was born with and nobody knows about it? He doesn't know about it? Do his parents know that he has this? And if so, why haven't they told him? Sahara asks a really important question. She asks, Noah, are you the only one who can do this? 
great questions. I'll give you one clue. Look at the title of the book and the title of the series, The Noah Files, N period, O period, A period, H period. Is that uh, an acronym, a name for an organization or an experiment or something? So the Noah Files, somebody's keeping a file on him. This is I Am the Walrus by Neil Schusterman and Eric Elfman, I, the first book in the series, The Noah Files. It's available at EVPL. Come into the library and we can get a copy for you. This has been Chapter Book Storytime. I'm Ellen from EVPL Oakland. Thank you for joining me. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.